Hello, and welcome to another episode of Shattered Lives, the Irish Daily Star's crime podcast. I'm crime correspondent Michael O'Toole, and chief reporter Paul Healy uh, is with me now. Hello, Paul. Hello, Mick. So it's been a very, very hectic few days. It's now Wednesday evening. We're recording this on Wednesday evening. So this is the third day since the dramatic scenes when Mr. Hutch walked free from the Special Criminal Court on Monday afternoon after being acquitted of the February 2016 murder of David Byrne by the non-jury Special Criminal Court. You know, he may he has been enjoying his freedom. He's been spotted around town, videoed and photographed. So a lot has happened uh, since the, the, the acquittal, even though we were expecting nothing to happen. Yes, an awful lot has happened. Um, I almost don't know where to begin, but I, <clears throat> I suppose it's worth beginning on the fact that Jerry Hutch has not left Ireland. And that's quite evident now by the fact that he has been photographed um, multiple times in the last two days. Um, the first photographs emerged in our paper, the Irish Daily Star and in the Irish Mirror uh, this morning. And um, those photographs were taken by our colleague uh, Mick O'Neill. Um, <clears throat> and they, <laughs> what's interesting about these photographs is that uh, 20, 24 hours after the monk walked free uh, from the Special Criminal Court and quite dramatically walked out onto the street and everybody could see uh, this great big beard of his and the long hair and the dramatic look, uh, 24 hours later the beard is gone and he's got a, a nice haircut for himself so he's cleaned himself up quite considerably. And do, do not think, I was struck by this, he looks completely different, I mean it was a spectacular Grug and beard he had. Fair play to him. I mean, it was, they rocked. But, we, you know, when you saw the pictures, Mick O'Neill's pictures through the, the windscreen, he, he did look really different. I mean, it did take years off him. It did. And uh, I suppose it's fair for me, for me to say, look, OK, um, there's a couple of things I want to cover in relation to this. OK, so I... Uh, was in the vicinity of Mr. Hutch myself as well. Um, and so I saw him and uh, Mick O'Neill saw him obviously as well. And we initially didn't realize it was him because he kind of came past us. And then there was a realization of, oh, okay, that, oh my God, it's Jerry Hutch. Because you, your brain does this thing. I mean, he obviously has an incredibly recognizable face, right? And he's been in the papers for 20 plus years. So he, he has a very unique face. Nonetheless, your brain does this thing where, you know, I've, I only saw him uh, 24 hours prior with the beard. So you just don't expect to see that look. But once we had another second look, it's, it's unmistakable. It was Jerry Hutch. And it was quite surprising to see. Um, we're not going to name the location of where he was. I think that's fair for Mr. Hutch's own safety. Um, and I think just you know, look, he's not asking necessarily for anybody to expose his exact whereabouts. Nonetheless, I want to, I want to cover that uh, as well, because Jerry Hutch, in my view, is not hiding from the public. He's not hiding from anybody. He is in the greater Dublin area and has been seen now multiple times over the past 48 hours. He's not necessarily huddled up in a particular property and not leaving. He has we know, uh, gone to uh, gone to a local shop. And there has also been a video taken that I've seen that's been spread around multiple times by a member of the public uh, of Jerry Hutch walking um, a, a particular Dublin street as well. So he has been out and about. So we did publish the first photographs, yes, but he certainly isn't hiding by, by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, and look, um, just one thing, I bet you uh, you didn't just say, oh, when you saw him. Because I've been in a situation like that, and I bet you it's a wee bit stronger than that, Paul. Uh, it was all fuck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, I, I think what you might be alluding to is that you know, there, there has been some criticism. And let, let's address this. I have no problem addressing this. There has been some criticism of photographs in the media. That's no problem. Look, my view on this is, uh, thankfully, there's a free press. And within various torts and various laws, we can act the way we do. But by the same token, for me, people can be pissed off with this and people can tell us they're pissed off with this and that's fine. Yes, I... Th I'm not going to say let them at it. People mm. are extremely entitled to their views, but thankfully we're extremely entitled and we have the right as citizens and as journalists to photograph a man in a public street. So, I, you know, if people are annoyed, no problem. 
We're not, we're not going to do our job. And I want to address that as well. Uh, where we photographed Jerry Hutch yesterday, uh, it was nowhere near the property that he is residing. Well, it was near the property he's residing in, but it was not on the street or anywhere within the immediate vicinity of the property he's residing on. And we felt uh, we were not going to photograph uh, that particular property, and we we did not do so. Um, and I didn't approach Jerry Hutch because the circumstances were that he was in a vehicle, and there was another uh, individual with him, and just. You know, we do take considerations uh, into account, not going to run in front of Jerry Hutch uh, in a vehicle and approach him in that particular uh, capacity. So, listen, I didn't take the photographs, but I will defend my colleague here. He had every right to take those photographs. It's in the public interest. And I believe even Jerry Hutch knows and probably knew if he was going to be sticking around in Dublin and walking out and about as much as he has, that he was going to be photographed at some point. And I'm not going to hide from this. I was involved in this as well. So I I can't blame you and Mick. It was the three of us together. So I will certainly defend it. And, you know, is Mr. Hutch a public figure? I think he is. And I think he has been for three decades. And I think that's one of the reasons why there are so many people listening to this pod. You know, it just strikes me sometimes people are quite happy for us to do stories that they like. And that they want us to write, but when we do stories that they don't like, it's, it's the end of the world. I, I, you know, I think everybody should have a wee bit more equilibrium. We do what we do. People are happy with it, Grant. If people are unhappy with it, Grant. Not really going to stop us doing what we do. And my, that's just my opinion as a grizzled old hack. And and so they, they can say what they want. There's no problem. Say what you want, Grant. Yeah, everyone's entitled to their opinion. We don't need to necessarily resort to vitriol and abuse. Uh, as some people have, but that's that's not reflective of most people's views, I think. And I, I do believe that Jerry Hutch, um, at least with the photographs uh, that, that we're discussing, our photographs that were in uh, the, the, the Star newspaper today, I don't really think he cared. We didn't expose where he was, uh, his location. And then in terms of his appearance, people might say, oh, you exposed his new look. Um, he looks more like he looked uh, over the past 20 years than ever before. Yes, he's he's aged. Um, but if anything, the beard, the striking beard look was more bizarre and unlike what he actually <laughs> normally appears like to most people. He looks, I mean, Jerry Hutch's face is indistinguishable. Uh, every, everybody knows what he looks like. And, you know, with the greatest respect to anybody, you know, growing a beard and growing your his hair long, that will not necessarily protect him from the Kenyan cartel if they want to get him. Do you know what I'm saying? With the greatest of respect, I think he, even he would know that he, he... Guards would still think that there's a severe threat on him. Um, and I don't think a beard... And, and that thing will, will you know, protect him. Mm. So do you have... I'm, I'll, I'll give you my theory, but do you have your own theory or even from your own sources uh, from Intel that you know as to why... Jerry Hutch is still here. Why he hasn't left the country? I, I don't. I'll be honest. I think um, I, I, I would be pretty co- uh, confident the guards believe he's going to go, and that they're surprised that he hasn't gone yet. Um, they do think the threat is severe here against them, and they think it's more likely than not, and sooner rather than later, he will leave Ireland. What's your theory? Um, it's only a theory, but if you recall uh, that when the monk was arrested, I think there was a passport issue. I don't know if the passport was considered to be a genuine passport. And um, in the time period that he has come back here, has there been an issue with the passport in terms of has it expired? Is he looking for another passport? Could it be as simple as that? Um, we don't know, but um, it's only a theory. But I can say, I think we can be satisfied that it was not a legitimate Croatian passport. I don't think anybody would think uh, <laughs> yeah. Jerry Hutch is a Croatian citizen. So I, I, I think we can say with some certainty that that was a dodgy passport. No, yeah, because look, he's he's been and this is an educated guess. He's been out of Ireland for a number of years, and then when he came back, he was extradited here and brought to prison. So uh, is his passport out of date? Could it be that? Well, somebody asked. I mean, this is one of the great things I like about this part is the interactions. And somebody did DM me going, Mick, what about his passport? Does he have, has, has he got, was his passport taken off him? And I went, oh, hold on. Because I remember, I'm, I'm talking about other cases. You know, you've done them. I've done them. You, you cover murder trials and whatever. And if people go for bail, one of the uh, one of the clauses in bail or is, or one of the conditions in bail is that you hand up your passport. But he didn't, he didn't get bail. He, uh, you know, so that wasn't an issue. So maybe, maybe the guards see, who knows? Not, not, a wee, not a Scooby. Maybe you're right. Maybe his passport is out of date. Maybe he's doing his damnedest to get out. Maybe he's going to stay. We, don't, we, we only he knows in his 
people around him know, but I do think guards are surprised he's still here. And they are expecting him to go. Well, another thing is uh, something that I was told about the monk before, and I'm sure you've been told this, is that uh, he, oft- he often does uh, the, the one thing that no one expects him to do is the thing that he does. Um, you know, like we were all theorizing he's going to go to Spain, he's going to go to Turkey, he's going to go to wherever. Um, where he's actually ended up is, is the one place you probably wouldn't imagine that he would be. Um, therefore, that's where he is. Um, no one would have predicted that he would have walked straight through the main doors of the court and out into the public in the way that he did. That's exactly what he did. Um, I think he likes to keep people guessing. I, I think he's a very intelligent man. I think he knows full well, as I said, that he's going to be photographed. Every movement, I'd say, is calculated in that regard. Um, and perhaps maybe he has decided to stay for the time being. Um, I would say that friends of his have claimed... Um, that he was sticking around for a few days to celebrate his 60th birthday with uh, family and friends and then he was going to take a flight and that we actually had that story in the star that the flights were booked um, and I've been told that he, that there are flights booked and that he intends to leave within days and that tallies with your information from your your sources but we'll see what happens but uh, and this is the beauty of, of of us trying to predict because we could be totally convinced we're right and then he could change his mind half an hour later and we have the egg in our face, but that's journalism. So, you know, we'll build a bridge and get over it. That's grand. So uh, it, we've had time. Well, we haven't had time because we've been running around like blue arse flags, as we say in Belfast. But the dust is beginning to settle somewhat on the, the case and the judgment by Miss Justice Tara Burns. What, what are your thoughts now that we're three days on? Well, I've been asking questions, you know, of sources, I'm sure that you have as well. And it, certainly there's indications that this investigation, well, you, we know the investigation is live. Um, there have been some interesting things that were said in the judgment by Ms. Justice Tara Burns um, in relation to the proving of the existence of the Hutch organized crime group and the members involved and their involvement in the Regency Hotel. So it'll be interesting to see now whether certain individuals will be arrested Will they be questioned? Um, and I think there's people with legitimate questions to answer. We alluded to we alluded to Patsy Hutch. Patsy Hutch was photographed out on the streets of Dublin yesterday. He was walking out and about on O'Connell Street, you know, the biggest street in the city centre. I mean, he's again not exactly hiding himself. Um, Miss Justice Tara Burns effectively said that Patsy Hutch, uh, it's feasible, it's possible that he arranged the Regency Hotel uh, attack. A sensational, incredible thing to say. And he's walking... And the Jerry Hutch. Sorry, and the Jerry Hutch. She said it's possible, because I think Conor, uh, Brendan Graham said this, it's possible that Jerry Hutch come in afterwards to, you know, to mop things up or try and fix things. Yes. Um, well, I actually want to read out the quote from Miss Justice Tara Brown. She, she said it just at, towards the end of her judgment. In fact, a reasonable possibility arises on the evidence that the Regency was planned by Patsy Hutch and that Gerard Hutch stepped in as head of the family to attempt to sort out the aftermath of the Regency, particularly as his own life was at risk. So the evidence, she said, pointed to the possibility and something that we had heard all along, that Jerry Hutch was out of the country at the time, that he came back in to clean up, that he went up north with Jonathan Dowdall in these meetings that were effectively arranged by Dowdall and this individual named We to uh, bring about peace talks with Republicans, uh, uh, between Republicans that would get them a meeting with the Kinnahans. And that, that's what Jerry Hutch supposedly came in to do. And, and Miss Justice Tara Burns determined that that was a reasonable possibility based off the evidence. So Patsy Hutch has an awful lot to answer in that regard. And then in relation to Shane Roan meeting him in the Malahide Industrial Estate on the 9th of March 2016 and the movement of the firearms, uh, Miss Justice Tara Burns said that Patsy Hutch was in all likelihood involved in the transfer of those weapons. Again, a major assertion. So she's saying those are very incriminating things that he has now been linked to. Do you think it's possible for Gardy to ignore not ignore, but to not act on that. I mean, you know, you have a high court judge, which is what is Justice Tara Burns is. She's in the high court in the act, you know, over in the special criminal court part of it. You know, she's the top judge, and she said this. So you would think, prima facie, shall we say, that the guards will have to make a move. They're not going to sit in their hands, really, can they? You would think so, but that's why it was so jarring to see Patsy Hutch walking down O'Connell Street, um, and you'd nearly wonder, was there something in his mind? 
Oh, maybe that's maybe he does that every day. We don't know, but um, I mean, uh, he certainly hasn't changed his routine. And down there in Champions Avenue, where he lives, uh, there is a twenty-four hour guard post. Um, the threat to his life is still considered so severe that the guards have to monitor and watch that house twenty-four-seven. Um, and yet he continues to brace uh, the the inner city and go out and, and and walk about the streets. He hasn't been lifted. He hasn't been arrested. He hasn't been charged with any offence. We don't know other than the guards say the investigation is open. But certainly the finger has been pointed at him now multiple times. So I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but you would think he has questions to answer. Yeah, especially when a judge, say, a judge says it in a criminal court. And one thing about that, that, that protection post, it is very interesting because at the height of the feud, there were several guards that called them posts. Uh, I, I think the management would call them community reassurance posts because they would argue that they're not only are they there to protect Patsy Hutch, they are there to offer reassurance and protection to anybody who lives in the same area as him. But back in the day, there there were several posts and they have all gradually dwindled. And there's now, there, now there's only one, and that's from Patsy Hutch. So for me, that's an indication that he is, obviously the guards believe that man is at risk. And that's why there's, Armed guardi- or that's why they're a guardian outside the house twenty four seven. That's a big indication. Yeah, well, I mean, not even, not even Jared Hutch at this stage has that level of protection. Um, there are patrols. We know. Uh, I've, I've saw quite a few of them over the last two days. So certainly the guards are keeping a close eye. But they're not sitting. They're not sitting outside the properties in. But there, yes, but you were quite right because there was a post in the area where Mr. Jared, where Jerry Hutch lives for quite some time at the height of the feud. So that was one place. There were several others. We know that there were uh, Johnny, the the brother who died a few years ago. There was a permanent post at his on his street, and there were others as well. I can think of a couple of others. So there were a lot of resources going into protection, protecting targets, and now that's whittled down to one, and that's Patsy Hutch. Yes, and just I want to speak about just further about the detail, the interesting detail that came out about the Hutch criminal organization, which detective. Superintendent uh, Gallagher gave evidence in the trial uh, in relation to the existence of, and he is a seasoned detective and with with years of experience. And the judges accepted beyond all reasonable doubt uh, his evidence of the existence of this crime group. Now that evidence was not evidence against Jerry Hutch, but it was evidence against the two other co-accused men who've been found guilty, you know, Paul Murphy and Jason Bonney, um, of facilitating the murder. But uh, she, the, the, I thought this was an interesting thing. That that's why I wanted to probe it a bit further. That uh, Tara Burns, Miss Justice Tara Burns, stated that um, while this wasn't evidence against Jared Hutch, the evidence of Detective Superintendent Gallagher established the existence of this group, leading the judges to conclude that the Regency was carried out by this group. And I want to just go through some of the evidence that clarified her position on this. Um, so. The evidence is in relation to the possession of the AK-47s by Jerry Hutch on the 7th of March. So the judges accepted that Jerry Hutch was in possession of the AK-47s on the 7th of March or possibly earlier. But there was evidence, there was no evidence to corroborate whether he was in control of the weapons at the time of the Regency itself. So just to remind listeners, uh, Paul, that the, the, the when when Miss Justice Tarburn said he had, was in possession of the Kalashnikovs, on the 7th of March. That's more than a month after the Regency because the Regency happened on the 5th of February 2016. Yes, uh, and, and she stated that on the basis of the evidence on the tapes that Jerry Hutch was in control of and in possession of the weapons on the 7th of March. Um, but that was not the charge that, that he was in court over. So, you know, he's not charged in relation to the firearms. Um, then she also stated that the evidence uh, showed the involvement of Patsy Hutch in the handing over of the guns to Shane Rowan, the possession of the guns by Patsy Hutch, Prior to, uh, prior to that, uh, the possession of, and the arranging of the of the booking of the room by Patsy Hutch, uh, the room that was booked for Kevin Murray, and then uh, also just in relation to Patsy Hutch and Nettie Hutch uh, having a, a connection with one another in, in within the confines of this organised crime group. Obviously, Nettie Hutch, Eddie Hutch, uh, is deceased. Was murdered on the eighth of February. Um, but uh, she she stated that uh, Nettie, Nettie Hutz, Patchy Hutz clearly have a connection with, in light of the evidence uh, being detailed, being at the centre of operations um, in terms of uh, the transit van that, that departed from Buckingham Street, uh, Buckingham Village, sorry. If you remember the, the transit van, the Silver 4 transit van, which the hit team 
uh, went out Buckingham Village and arrived at the at the Regency Hotel Inn. Um, and another name that came up was Jonathan Hutch. Now, I do not recall Jonathan Hutch's name being said by Detective Superintendent Gallagher. I think there were names redacted when they spoke about the existence of uh, this organized crime group. But um, Miss Justice Tara Burns mentioned uh, the finding uh, of, of a phone a glo- in a glove box uh, in Jonathan Hutch's car um, and that this formed some of the evidence in the case in relation to the investigation into the Regency Hotel. So even Jonathan Hutch's name has been mentioned and raised in relation to the existence of this organised crime group. Um, so obviously Eddie Hutch cannot answer these allegations. He is deceased, but you've got Patsy Hutch and you've got Jonathan Hutch. Uh, their names have been raised in the context of this trial and they, they haven't launched any kind of defence in relation to the allegations uh, surrounding them. So the investigation, as I said, on the night of the acquittal, I read it, the statement from the guards, and you're quite right, Paul, the investigation is ongoing and they've launched an appeal. I do get the sense, not again, famous last words, I do get the sense that the investigation will now not go to back burner, but I can't imagine them doing anything, anything hasty. I think the guards will, you know, try and have all their ducks in a row before they make it, um, make any moves on whoever they might decide to go after. I don't think there'll be a, uh, you know, a, a knee-jerk reaction, although we haven't said that, there'll probably be a raid in, in the next 10 minutes. But you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying it's, 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 for me, you know, it's very likely that they'll pause, reassess, re-examine the evidence, and then do what they've got to do, or what they decide is necessary to do. Yeah, I, I just want to go back to Jonathan Hutch briefly, if that's okay, because I just I, I, I omitted just it's a little bit more of the evidence in relation to him. So there was evidence from a Detective Sergeant Alan Lynch uh, who, who said that on the 9th of February, so this is days after the Regency, uh, they called to the North, North Charles Street area uh, where there was a black Skoda that was of interest to Gardaí in relation to the Regency. Uh, this black Skoda, they believed, was was of interest in relation to the investigation into the convoy of vehicles that travelled to the Regency Hotel. And they uh, um, they approached Jonathan Hutch in relation to this car and he indicated that he was the owner of the car. The car was seized and they searched it and they found that phone that I, that I discussed with you, Mick, in the glove box. And the examination of the phone showed that it was only used on one day, the day of the Regency, the 5th of February. There were only three phone numbers saved on that. Uh, one called Boise, one called JP, and another called P7P. And they looked into the the communication between all of these phones on the 5th of February, and they were all in communication with each other around the time um, that this convoy of vehicles and the, the persons suspected of being involved uh, were in transit. So it's, it's, a, it's interesting to see what they might establish in relation to that, if anything. Um, as I said, Jonathan Hutch, we've not heard from him. We don't know what his defense is in relation to that. Um, but but it's interesting because I, I think that's that's a little factor that maybe got missed along the way. In the, I mean, there's so much in this case, but that just goes to show you the meticulous nature of the Garda investigation into this. And would it be fair, Paul, to think that there's still plenty of Ave- there are still plenty of avenues for Gardaí to go down in relation to this whole investigation. You know, it's a, this may, this is being seen as a setback, and obviously, but it's it's not over. No, it's not over. Um, I mean, look, there's six people involved here, uh, in the sen- in the hit team. Um, but I think Miss Justice Tara Brent stated that there could have been up to at least twelve people involved in the overall, uh, hit. I mean, it was a sophisticated, planned hit. Um, clearly involves quite a bit of planning. And we've mentioned Jonathan Hutch there and Patsy Hutch, their names were raised. The, the name of James Mago Gately was also raised. Now, the problem with that is that that was in the evidence of Jonathan Dowdall and the evidence of Jonathan Dowdall in the case of Jerry Hutch was rejected. Um, Jonathan Dowdall claimed uh, that Jerry Hutch told him that it was him and Mago Gately that shot David Byrne. Um, again, we haven't heard... Uh, Mago Gately's defence in relation to that. We don't know whether Mago Gately is under investigation, but those are the names that have been raised in the context of this. I'm sure there are other individuals that have been looked at. Uh, we know that Jason Bonney and Paul Murphy have been convicted. Um, and then you mentioned Jer- um, uh, uh, Mick before, I think we should discuss that Jerry Hutch is also under 
active investigation, not in relation to the Regency, as far as we're aware, but there are other active investigations in relation to him. Do you think anything might come of that while he's still in the country? I, I'm going to answer that, but I just want to go back to what Miss Justice Tara Burns said, because when, when I was watching your tweets, when Miss Justice Burns, Burns spoke about 12 people involved being involved in this, that jumped out at me, and I'll tell you why that jumped out at me. This has been going on a long time. We did a story, I, th I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks after the Regency. Um, obviously, uh, there were Kenyan people briefing certain people, and we got briefings. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, look, and we, I was told, I'll put it this way, the Kenyans believed there were 12 people involved in this operation. So that jumped out at me, that Miss Justice Tara Burns had all this information. But how, you know, can you? How did how did they know? Yeah, I mean, that, uh, but if you recall, even um, in the immediate aftermath of this, names were already popping up left, right, and centre as to who was supposedly involved. Um, so uh, it, it does make you wonder, you know, how did it take six, seven years to get anybody before the courts in relation to it? Um, Sorry, I should mention that Patrick Hutch Jr. did face trial um, and a null prosecute was entered. Uh, that trial collapsed in 2019. Um, there were allegations raised in this trial as well in relation to his uh, alleged involvement that he may be the man in drag. That evidence was all propped up and raised again. Um, so there's questions in relation to that. Um, it's clear, it's obvious to me that the Garda investigation is meticulous and uh, in nature and there was a huge amount of manpower and work went into it, obviously. And they wanted, obviously, to, to I mean, given the, the scope and the size of it, they, they were, the, the, the investigation was unprecedented. And I don't want to make it sound like they didn't investigate this. They clearly, thoroughly investigated this and it's a complex investigation um, where people, some of the people in the investigation were out of the jurisdiction for a long time as well, I have to add. Yeah, and you know, just to, just to explain this, the way it works in Ireland, you know, the guards do the investigating, they put together the investigative file, they send it to the DPP, the Director of Public Prosecutions. Now, there are consultations and round tables and stuff, but at the end of the day, it's the Director of Public Prosecutions who proffers a charge. That's what happened here with Jer uh, Jerry Hodge. And then it goes to the courts. So it's not as if the guards prosecute the case. Guards are there, but it's it's Sean Galan and, you know, there, there's the state prosecutors, so they do their bit and the judges do their bit. But, you know, effectively, once the guard uh, investigation, the investigative file is sent to the DP, that's more or less it for the guards. So do, do you know what I'm saying? That there are plenty of hoops after that. But you did ask me about uh, other elements of any investigation that Jared Hodge, and we know we, 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 we did write about this before, that he was arrested. For an investigation into allegations or suspicions of directing a gang before, uh, and that arrest happened shortly before he went on trial last October. I think it was, it was the end of September that he was arrested. He was taken out of prison. You have to take him out under a Section 42 warrant. Guards can't go in and, and take him out anyway. So he was arrested, held, I think, for 12 hours and brought back. That investigation is ongoing. And some people had been thinking that that investigation would be ready to arrest Mr. Hutch for charge if he got acquitted this and was walking out the gates and we had the story on Monday sent well actually no because the file is still hasn't been sent to the DPP yet the investigative phase is finished they're now working on putting the file together shall we say and, and making a convincing or persuasive case but I just wonder will this verdict damage that investigation even sort of mentally will it be you know the state didn't get this case across the line. By no means did they get the, the case across the line. Miss Justice Tara Burns eviscerated Jonathan Dowdall, for example. I wonder will that have some sort of even subconscious or bearing on what did, what happens in the next investigation? You, you, know, you know what I'm trying to say? That there might not be any, that might may be dead in the water. We don't know, but, you know, I'd say maybe the bar got higher after this. That's interesting. And I mean, if the passport theory that we have about Jared Hutch is wrong, um, and uh, he knows he's under an active investigation. You would think he might fear arrest. He's uh, he must be maybe quietly confident that he's not going to be arrested anytime soon. <laughs> Why would he stick around for that? If, uh, you'd have to wonder, unless he feels, you know, um, I don't have a case to answer. You know. Well, I, I can tell you, from the guidance I've been working on, this is a good while away because it's going to be several months, I believe, before the file is completed. Then it goes to DPP, and obviously this is a big case. So there will, like, if you always think, do you remember the, 
the sports star who was arrested over a serious assault on a woman. I remember we, we, you know, we all reported on that. And it was months before the DPP decided. So I don't think this one would be any different. In other words, it's going to take several months before she gets the file. And then I would anticipate several months before a decision. And do you think that they do, I suppose, in an unofficial capacity or even an official capacity, say, look, and the, this person has been previously prosecuted on another charge that was unsuccessful. So you need to really give me thorough, uh, like a, a more thought uh, goes into it, even subconsciously. I, I think even subconsciously, I think they're going to be saying, look, we need to cut, dot every I and cross every T, unlike ever before. Not that you said that this, the, the recency was a meticulous investigation, but how could it not affect the law officers and the senior guardy? I mean, everybody's human and, you know, this was a massive case. It was a massive victory for Jerry Hutch. So, you know, I think it would be naive, naive of us not to think that this would have an effect on the on other investigation, even subconsciously. I mean, everybody's human. You, you know what I mean? So who knows? But I, I personally think the chances have receded. Yeah, I, I think uh, we said we stated on the other pod, both of us, that we felt that Jerry Hutch was going to be acquitted, that it would be a not guilty verdict. And I do think that there was... Uh, and over uh, the vast majority of people who followed this case without necessarily identifying anybody felt that way. And I just want to say that for the integrity of the special criminal court, because it, it, it this is something that like it receives so much criticism, the necessity for the existence of the special criminal court. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that that was the verdict because it, uh, if, for me, it empowers the special criminal court and it shows that it works because Jason Bonney and Paul Murphy, the evidence was there and they were in the case and they were able to convict them. So it's proof they can get a conviction upon the evidence, but the evidence was not there for Jared Hutch. We mentioned that the special criminal court had a 90 plus percent conviction rate and there was a fear, you know, people have stated uh, um, on social media and otherwise, oh, it's a kangaroo court and it's, you know, inevitable that Jerry Hutch will be convicted because that's just a special criminal court. Well, thank God, it, it's not the case. You know, they, they do meticulously, judges do meticulously examine the evidence before them. And he was not convicted uh, as a result of that. And so to me, that shows the power of the special criminal court. It shows um, the legitimacy of it. I, 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 we said this the last time, but I'll, I'll say it again. I personally, my view was he should be acquitted, but I did fear it, or suspect more than you, let's say, that there was a possibility that he would be convicted. And that was because of of my experience covering the Special Criminal Court and the higher uh, conviction rates. But I did believe that he should be acquitted. I, I've got a mental mental block about mixing up acquitting and conviction here. It's doing my head. Yes. So for me, he should have been acquitted, but I did believe it was it was likely possible that he would be convicted. based off based off the statistic but but as i said for the integrity of the court it's, it's a good thing that this has happened as i said because and i mean maybe people might think oh well this means they won't be able to go after other people well if anything it shows um yeah look based off the evidence if the evidence is there you will be convicted that, that these judges um, and i think miss just tarburn said at the outset of her judgment um that we're real people too. We we live in the real world, and you know that they're not some sort of kind of external alien force that uh, that can't look at facts rationally. Um, they're people too, and when they looked at the barefaced facts, the case was not there. Can we talk about just changing tax slightly because this fascinates me? Have you ever seen a public reaction as strong as this? Now I have seen plenty of reactions. I remember. Covering, I did what you did. I did the, the Graham Dwyer trial every day, and I was blah 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 going away, and it was a mile a minute. And I remember covering that, and the reaction was huge, right? And the reaction to this has been huge, but I think there's a significant difference. A lot, everybody, not that Twitter is the real world, but everybody on social media, for me, was convinced Graham Dwyer was guilty. There were, there were a few naysayers, but largely, I would say about ninety five. 97% of all the interactions I had, DMs, everything, was that fucker's guilty, right? Were you surprised or amazed or whatever by the popular support for Jerry Hutch? Because from what I could see, most disinterested, as in not uninterested, but disinterested, by that I mean people who don't have skin in the game, they're not guards, 
not associates of Jerry Hutch, not lawyers who you would speak to. Joe and Josephine Ponder. For me, the bulk of them wanted an acquittal. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I even think that people in the courtroom, I uh, don't want to speak for every reporter in the courtroom, but anyone that covered the trial day in, day out, like myself, had that overarching feeling that uh, after all 52 days of it, that where's the smoking gun, where is the evidence? Most people who examined the case in any basic detail felt it had to be an acquittal. It, 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 no, regardless of your feelings. of, I mean, obviously, Jerry Hutch is a bit of a... Um, a uh, popular figure for for people, uh, and and uh, you know he, he's somebody who has graced the papers, uh, the different pages of the newspapers for twenty plus years. So there there has been a bit of a swell of of public support for him in in that capacity. But outside of that, even anyone who just looked at the case has said, yeah, look, there is no there there in relation to the murder charge. Mm-hmm. And people were were rooting for him. Oh, I mean, yeah. like, really rooting for him. It was, it was <laughs> free, free the monk campaign and all this. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's yeah. Not, and, and again, that's again, this is something I really, really believe in. People have the right to say what they want. You know, you know what I'm saying? If the people want to go and have a free the monk campaign or, or whatever, grand, let them at it. It's we, we, we're, we, we're lucky to live in a country where everybody can do everything like that. That's no problem. Yeah. And look, I mean, Jared Hutch, uh, I think when he walked out of the courts, just, your brain does this thing with the look with the shaggy with the shaggy beard and all that um you know he just looked he, he looked like a convict he'd come out of prison and there's kind of a face of a criminal a hardened criminal um but to me now the life that he seems to be living and seems to want to live is a quiet retired life uh he looks like a and he i mean he was well dressed uh, today and yesterday uh, and to me he wants to go off and live his life in the sunset um so Look, perhaps he's entitled to that. Uh, you know, Mr. Justice Tara Burns said the evidence did not show uh, necessarily that he was involved in any of this world of gangland crime or whatever. None of us were born yesterday. Obviously, there's a history there, and he was suspected of uh, things that we don't need to even get into. Um, but in, in my mind, um, he, he looked like a, a normal bloke now who wants to get on with his life. It remains to be seen whether that's the case. Um, the... the, the, the the swell of the public support is unusual to me. It's a bit strange. Uh, like this cult figure type status is a bit odd. I understand, but obviously for us, he, he generates headlines, so there is an interest. But one day, probably very soon, he will be tomorrow's news. He'll sail off to the sunset or whatever, fly off to the, uh, to the sunshine, and won't be heard from again. I imagine. I think he's he. I think he wants a quiet life. That's what I suspect. I would be very surprised if anyone got a comment out of him. Maybe there'll be an exclusive interview from somebody tomorrow, but I, I get the impression uh, he wants the quiet life, um, and, and that, that's, I think we will hear very little from him in the future. I'm going to respectfully disagree about, um, about one thing he said there. I think he is a massive public figure and there will be enduring public interest in him. There'll be sniff- we'll, we'll still be sniffing around him because people are still very interested in him. I mean, that, that's, I mean it, 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 like, to be fair, people can't lionise him on social media and Twitter. And expect the media to leave him alone or or ignore him or whatever. You know, I mean, it's you have to have a bit of cop on there. No, I, I, yeah, I think that's fair. And I, look, I mean, obviously, I think especially within the immediate aftermath of this trial, it makes it makes sense that uh, we would pursue him for comment, and that's what we have been doing. To me, it seems like he doesn't wish to, and that's fair enough. Um, I, I do think as the weeks die down. Uh, We'll just we'll hear less of him. And that doesn't mean he will, it won't he, there won't be he won't be newsworthy again. I'm sure. But I my impression is that he wants to set off to the sunset and never be heard from again. It remains to be seen whether that happens. Yes, and and that's a question of whether various people, including the Kenahan cartel, will let him. I think that's unlikely. But there is just I just want to make one final point because as you you did mention the evidence of Detective Superintendent Dave Gallagher from the Drugs and Organized Crime Bureau about the existence of the and the crystallization of this Hutch organized crime gang. I think everybody needs to, to realize and we need to say for the record, that gang is like something that fell off the Kenahan cartel. Do you know what I mean? They are titchy in compared to the Kenahan cartel who were and in my opinion are still a direct threat to national security in Ireland. They have so much money and so many resources. They're extremely dangerous. So it's not even boys against men. It's some, somebody really titchy against somebody really huge. 
And I think we should all bear that in mind. And I, I, I want to mention a story by our colleague John Hand today, um, where he, st- he he stated that there there is um, intelligence, and certainly we've we've heard this as well in the, in the past. Um, although it's interesting to see that it's still the case. This is John's information that that that, that there is still a concern um, that a particular female. Uh, associates shall we say of the Kinahan cartel are still out for revenge they still want blood um in and and are are, are more empowered than ever in that in, in in relation to what's just happened um with Jared Hutch um so it's in, it's interesting to see that certain uh certain women still want uh still want revenge are are still bloodthirsty in this um and and it's personal for for some for for some people still, uh, and, and you've mentioned the resources of this cartel, but to 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 some within it and its associates within it, this is still something that is deeply deeply personal. And there's a concern now, um, from Gardi, of a potential escalation in this feud again, or that the feud may reignite in some way. We haven't really seen anything happen in in the Kinahan Hutch feud since what what maybe 2018. Well, the last murder was in at the end of January 2018. There have been several plots that Doc B and the Emergency Response Unit foiled. And, you know, they're still active. But I always say this, I think one of the reasons why, you look, remember, feud, all right, technically it was, but really it was an onslaught by the Kinnahans against people associated with the, the Hutch family. Really? I mean, you know, and they were, they were the, the Kinnahan cartel was terrorizing Northerners. I've said all this before. I've said it on this but the Kinnahan cartel were terrorizing North inner city Dublin. One reason why I think they they didn't, they stopped was they looked in and wanted to delegitimize himself as boxing's Mr. Big. And, you know, now he's on the ropes to use, to carry on that with analogy. So, look, you're right. I think it was personal for Kinnan and for that woman and for others involved. So, Yes, look, there's always that possibility. I think that may be the biggest fear, the biggest the biggest concern is that personal aspect, that it's still very, very personal to certain individuals. And then what 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 resources does the criminal organization have to, to, to meet that person's want? Well we, we know factually speaking that many of the leaders of the cartel are on the run, are wanted. There's there's sanctions the DAA are out to get them. Um Thomas Bomber Kavanaugh is in prison. Daniel Kinahan, we don't know where he is. His father, we don't know. Uh, Christie Jr. Um, they're cert- and and the Garda Commissioner did say they are diminished in their power. Um, so maybe people like Jared Hutch and 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 others maybe feel that the threat isn't as great uh, as it used to be, given the fact that 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 the cartel is on the run, um, and that many of its more dangerous associates are in prison, like Freddie Thompson uh, in prison for murder. So the circumstances are different. The lay of the land is different. But given that personal element, that particular bloodlust that uh, certain individuals have, uh, obviously there's still a, a grave concern that they may uh, possess or, or know people with the resources to, to, to carry out violence. And there are people who have taken over the mantle of leaders, commanders within the cartel in, in Britain and Ireland, for example, and we know who they are. So, you know, they're down, but they're not out. And they've got an awful lot of money and they've got an awful lot of resources. So, Look, I, I, I thought that was an interesting story by John. So, look, it's something we'll have to very much uh, keep an eye on because it, it just could explode at any minute. Please God, it won't because they were terrible times. They were really, really terrible times. I, I've spoken about this before. I, I hated seeing armed detectives and the ERU and the ASU in the streets doing roadblocks. It just reminded me of growing up in the North and, you know, the North was an abnormal society and I didn't like Dublin being like that. But that was the fault of the Kenyans who were going around killing people. Let's be honest here. So... I, I don't I mean I don't think anybody wants to go back to those days yeah we'll leave it there um, thanks very much again for listening to us uh, we're doing more pods this week obviously given the circumstances uh, I asked people for questions we'll ask for more questions over the coming days and we'll try to do a Q&A uh, when we can okay thanks very much everybody thanks for listening thank you